For me, a lot of the coaches we've had here and also a lot of the players, second ain't good enough. You get out there and push and push and push no matter what because you want to win. What we have is a big family here at Leeds and we're all just a bit of a jigsaw that fits into what is such a great club, it's a great place to work. This last 10 years has been great, but it doesn't have to end. The golden decade doesn't have to end, does it? The history of the Leeds Rugby League Club is a story with many ups and downs. silver linings of the 20th century came in the form of 11 Challenge Cups, but championship titles were a much rarer sight at Headingley. Well, I think Leeds Rhinos had, had always had good players, you know, really significant players of their generation, but not managed to get anything together. And Scully and Ellery and Graham Allroyd, those type of players, we were just standing there and watching finish second quite a lot. I was incredibly frustrated as a fan watching Leeds play. And so with my dad, I think there was one day, we just said we're not coming to watch anymore. We've been paying our money for this many years and they've just not been coming up with it. The late 90s, Leeds had got a side under Graham Murray that could win things and they went on to win the Challenge Cup at Wembley, but never really capitalised on that. The early part of, of the 2000s and the noughties were, were again, just a bit of a, a nearly team. In the 2002, three seasons, we, we had to blood a lot of young players and Daryl Paul really showed faith. Oh, Danny, yeah, I mean, uh, Danny lived near me and uh, as a kid, he used to come knocking at the door and say, take us a programme, will you, Billy? And get it signed for us. Well, it was a brave decision on Darrell's part, but uh, one with very much an eye on the future and one with uh, a belief that these players had got the talent. Kevin Sinfield, Jimmy Jones Buchanan, Ryan Bailey, Danny Maguire and Rob Burrow, they were significant in the, I would say, apprenticeship at, at that time. They were really starting to lay a marker down. But the young Leeds team suffered heartbreak of their own in 2003. A Challenge Cup final defeat to Bradford was a tough one to take in Darrell Powell's final season as head coach. Losing the Challenge Cup final whet the appetite for what was to come. I think at that time, the young lads that were brought in, plus some of that, the older guys, had had enough of, of being second best. The man tasked with taking Leeds to the top was Tony Smith. He'd impressed many when guiding Huddersfield to Super League and keeping them there. Hey, you've come up with one of those for him, a, a big duck egg. Let's go again, eh? Yeah. Right from, from day when he came in, you could see that his policies and, and the, the way he ran things was, was something which, which a championship team needed. Tony did a fantastic job and, and breaking everybody's game right down and building it right back up again. And, you know, some of the core skill periods that we went through, some of that... Uh, Long winter sessions over at Abbey Fields there, stood there in the, way, the rain and the sleet and the snow, catching and passing and everybody thinking, well, why are we doing all this catching and passing? I'm a big believer in the basic skills and the basics of the game that can then lead you on to the more complicated plays of the game. And we did do a lot of uh, catch, pass and, uh, and tackle on the Abbey Fields and in the mud and the slush. Uh, nobody could really see what, the reasons why we were doing it back then. But I'll tell you, mid-summer 2004, when 
uh, leads our uh, lead in the league you know certainly top two and being one of the best teams in the league you know this is before winning the title I think everybody realised then something had been put in place Tony Smith had come in and he, he just said listen I don't care what your name is I don't care what you've done in the past if you're willing to work hard for this group and, and tip your heart and, and guts in, uh, into the our cause you're going to get an opportunity and he always talked about sacrifice you know if, if you want to win trophies you have to sacrifice the things you do away from, from, from training, which which you probably want to do. Days of the week were irrelevant, not common, but was known for us to come in on Sunday mornings at ridiculous times, 6 and 7 a.m. So that sacrifice element of, of what you needed to do for the good of the team was just standard. That's, that's what we did. Somehow, just little things that he did, he'd, he'd go around the gym every morning and he'd just say, good morning. On Easter, he'd bring me a tiny little Easter egg. Man management-wise, he, he was just phenomenal. Tony Smith made us turn that corner and in 2004, you know, he was the, the prerequisite, if you like, for getting us to that grand final and giving us an opportunity to win it. A truly fantastic atmosphere. The theatre of dreams and a patch of grass on which dreams today will be made or will turn into nightmares. We were conscious that we were in a position to make history again or to relive some more history and make some more history. They hadn't won a championship for such a long time, but I tell you, that year there was, almost, there was a good feeling. I can recollect the 2001-2003 Challenge Cup finals where, where Bradford beat us. And I don't think we ever had the mentality that we were going to win, but 2004, never at any point did I think we were going to lose. We just enjoyed the occasion and we took in the atmosphere and everything just seemed to fall into place. It's a little surreal actually. Some of it flies straight past you and some of it almost seems like slow motion. The Bradford fans, I think they know the writing's on the wall. Maguire, senior, back to Maguire. Danny Maguire for Leeds! The young hero to win the grand final, maybe! Steve Ganson points to the spot. I think that was 10 years ago, it was unbelievable and, and when you look back at now at some of the footage and we're all there with baby faces, it's an incredible moment. Leeds have won the grand final, they've won the championship for the first time in 32 years. Robbie Paul, it goes wide, it's a knock on and so You know, 2004 was, was such a special year. You know, the club had been, you know, starved of success for so long, and you know, we had a lot of young, young lads in the squad that had come through the academy together. So, yeah, definitely great memories. It, it was a great, a great event, great night, and I was relieved just because you know we'd finally got that trophy after after supporting them so long. You know, 32 years since we've won our last championship. To see what it meant to so many people um, was huge. I think everybody involved that year on and off the field and, and for those who supported the club for so long, um, you know, I think it was a very proud moment for everybody concerned. Frenny Cummins was um, not picked, not selected for that game. Um, he was the first one to run on the field when the hooter went and I can remember him jumping in the air, punching the air. Bearing in mind that uh, prior to that season I think Frenny had the most consecutive games I think and had captained the the, the team and he had to accept some bad uh, news, uh, maybe even bad calls from the coach, but um, bad news from the coach certainly. And 
but it, it didn't show in the way that he celebrated that evening and I think that epitomises what a team should be about and I think it epitomises mostly what we were about that year. It's engraved in my memory forever and a day. Spend all that time together throughout the year, hoping that you're good enough to savour that on the field and I think those moments, those moments on the field are so special because they go so quick. To be uh, part of a group that was for the first team uh, to be involved for 30 odd years to, to lift the title is, uh, is something that stays with you. Again, we take it right back to Abbey Fields in the early stages of pre-season. The fellas would have been stood in the, in the cold, learning those core skills to then, you know, fast forward in almost, you know, 10, 11 months to them lifting the Super League trophy. For that to be the first one, that's something special and the, the, the first ones normally stay with you. And in 2004, the Rhinos are the Super League champions. I think I had one glass of red wine that night when I got back to the, to the ground with my wife. It's almost, not a sense of relief, but ah, <laughs> where you just sit back and yeah, savour that moment, I think, was my feeling. Um, I get great joy and, and it comes back to, once again, seeing the, the boys on the park celebrate after all the work that they've done, but for you, me as a coach, it's like, I'm glad it worked out and now I can go home and sleep properly for a night. <laughs> Super League success earned the Rhinos a crack at the world title. Canterbury Bulldogs came from Australia to Elland Road for the World Club Challenge. I had a recurring dream as a, as a child that I was the first ever uh, Leeds rugby player and Leeds United player at the same time and I wonder, used to wonder whether it was possible and obviously it's probably not possible uh, but playing for Leeds Rhinos at Ellen Road you know, at Leeds United's ground in some weird way it sort of brought the two together. I think it was 30, 38, 39,000 there, and you know, such a memorable night. You know, first time playing at Ellen Road. Great offload by McDermott to McGuire, who makes the break up the middle. He's got Marcus by in support. He takes the ball. Oh, magnificent! Personally, you know, scoring a try and getting man of the match, great night for me, but obviously for the club to be able to carry that, you know, world champions tag around with you for, for the rest of the year is. Such a great tool for you know the, the marketing and everything, and um, you know brilliant to be involved in that in that night. Now then, here is Maguire, here is Senior, Marcus Byle. Oh! I won't far away from it, and I can still hear the thud now. Uh, you know, Marcus were brilliant, unbelievable player, and so strong, and you know never seen that anybody put Marcus on on his backside, but uh, you know I think he ran ran into the wrong person that night. It's playing that game. Um, and such a massive occasion at such a, an important venue for me was really, really nerve-wracking. But I have to say, it's probably one of the best uh, days of my life as well. Leeds Rhinos are the champions of the world. The Rhinos made it to both major domestic finals in 2005, but were reacquainted with heartbreak when they got there. Paul Cook sealed a dramatic Challenge Cup win for Hull before grand final defeat to Bradford at Old Trafford. I actually think Leeds was, was the best team that year by a distance at times. Obviously, we didn't perform in the two big games, the Challenge Cup and, and the final, and that's not just down to us playing poor, obviously, but the other teams on the day doing better than us. Hull, Hull did better than us and, and Bradford did. Certainly 2006 was, was not quite as good. I think that was the first year JP was there. 2006 was a disastrous year for me. It was my first year at the club. I didn't play particularly well. The team didn't play particularly well. And I'm... Going to the 2007 season thinking, have I made the right move here? You know, people like that join the, the side and, and not getting the silverware again. It was disappointing, it was, it was a long off season when you weren't doing anything and, and, and not won anything, but I was still confident, as, as was Danny, Kev and Jamie Jones, people like that who'd been there, that we could, we, could, we could take success again. The Rhinos were back in the grand final in 2007, when an era-defining rivalry with St Helens was born. They just had this mode of playing, this, this philosophy where they got out dummy half play at 150 miles an hour. They had some phenomenal players and you could go to an Olsley Road uh, 12 minutes into the game and you'd be 18-0 down thinking, what has just gone on? 
you know, I think there's definitely a, a lot of respect between the two teams and you know the, the history and the tradition that both clubs have got. So to play them in uh, in grand finals was always a massive nerve-wracking thing. That rivalry between you know, 06 and 09 was, was fierce, was bitter. People seemed to perceive it as though there was a lot of hatred there, but at the end of the day it was, it was a grand final and, and both teams wanted to win. When you've got two teams vying for the top all the time, you build up dislikes for people. Rugby gives you such a focus and winning grand finals gives you such a focus that, that you will do anything to go out there and try and win it. And it was great to have one of those rivalries within Super League. I think it added to the competition. The rivalry there, I think just through the grand finals over the years, over the past decade, it's been massive and it still continues to this day. I think Saints as well have, you know, have a great generation of, of players and you know, testament to them that they've got to that many finals. And turning up at Old Trafford, 7, 8, 9, and playing against St. Helens when they were phenomenal, we've just managed to be able to go out there and do it in that wet weather. I think somebody once said, you, you never remember who finished second, but I can remember who finished second in 7, 8, and 9. Sorry, St. Helens. The 2007 Grand Final was a grand finale for Tony Smith. The Australian took charge of the Rhinos for the last time. I think when you look at the 2007 Grand Final, we went in as massive underdogs into that game. Um, St. Helens had been the dominant force, particularly in 2006 and then into 2007. Tony was a very technical coach, but he sat everyone down the night before the Grand Final and we were in a semicircle and we all had to speak about why we wanted to win the Grand Final. It was an incredibly emotional meeting, probably one of the most emotionally charged meetings that I've ever sat through within, within a rugby league club and I think that just brought the team together and that was the lift we needed to go out and go from underdog to go out and win. Still it goes, senior, senior to Donald, Donald back on the inside, this is good, it's going to be wet with the first try of the night, Brentwood the fullback is over, it was a wonderfully crafted try. I remember we came in at half time and it was incredibly close but we sprinted in, we sprinted at half time, and I remember saying to one of our guys, we've got this, look at these, we, we've got this, we'll go out and get this. And then we pulled away in the second half. It was one of the, I think, one of the greatest uh, grand final performances has been from any club. We ended up convincing winners in the grand final. Another six once Smith is tackled. Or maybe Lower Titi. Lower Titi all the way! Oh my word! What a finish! St. Helens caught cold. Leeds fans. Maybe sensing that this is their side's night tonight. And leads again. Here's Donald. Good play to get him clear. Donald's going to take on Wallace. It is a classic, classic wingers try. Great finish again. We all wanted to win for Tony in 2007. You always want to send a coach off on, on the best. You know, you don't always see eye to eye with a coach, but you always want to see him off on the best. And I'm really pleased for Tony that we sent him off in the right way with a, with a great win in a great grand final. It's Tupi. Linton Tupi says, who wants this? All right, I'll have it myself. Flashing the ball away, still showing it. And now he's got it off to Diskin. Diskin inside, Jones Buchanan. Buchanan will score. That's it. Fitting finale. So a wonderful performance. But that was all part of that process, I think, of, of building through 2006 and maybe things not going our way in, in some respects. And it was a great way to finish uh, personally on, on that note uh, with a club that I'm so grateful for the opportunity to, to, to come to, one of the biggest clubs in the world, and it was an honour to coach them. So to finish on that sort of note with club that I put so much into and, and gave me my chance as well as the chance to make some fantastic um, connections with some fantastic people and relationships and relationships that I hope will always remain and um, there's certainly a lot of respect um, I still whilst I, I coach another club there's still the utmost respect for the Leeds club and um, in the, the memories and and also the, how grateful I am to the club to give me an opportunity to coach uh, at such a great place. After tonight, it's no longer Tony Smith's Barney Army, but in his last game in charge, he has delivered a fairy tale ending. Leeds Rhinos, the Super League champions of 2007. After two grand final wins, Tony Smith was bound for the international arena with England and the Rhinos looked to the other side of the world
to find his replacement. Tony, of course, had done a terrific job uh, during his four years at the Rhinos, and he was the obvious choice to go on to, to coach England at that time. Brian McLennan came in completely different, really relaxed and had a great philosophy about him. Tony Smith was very demanding on everything. Everything that he did, he had to be here and he had to be there and he had to wear that right stuff and he had to do all that. And, and he was more demanding. With Bluey, he was totally the other way. As, as long as we were winning on the pitch, he was, he was happy with whatever we did. We'd have the technical side with Tony Smith and Brian McLennan tried to bring us closer together with a, with a motivational thing and, and brought in some very good things and kept us playing as a team and playing as a unit. And it's always difficult taking over an established group of players and the players that had enjoyed some success. But I think he developed an instant rapport with the players and, uh, and was to, to be able to build on the strengths that, uh, that Tony had, had put into the organisation and, of course, was to go on and achieve a, a lot of success. Just five games into his tenure, McLennan took the Rhinos back to the top of the world. A star studded Melbourne, beaten at Elland Road. The weather was really bad and, and, and the wind and the rubbish were just blowing all over the field. Probably the rain was going sidewards with a, you know, 70 mile an hour winds and you know, it was a real slug fest and I just remember the, the defences in that game were, were both on top and you know, it was a real brutal game. In every World Club Challenge, you know, we've come up against Manly a few times and, and Melbourne a few times and probably both them teams have the best players in the world so obviously we've, we've, we've won a few and lost a few but they've all been, you know, intense games and, and good learning curves for our players. To play against, you know, the, the best Australians in the world and and to do that as a, as a Leeds Rhinos team and to, and to come out victorious is uh, you know, a great occasion and you're absolutely superb to be involved in. Leeds backed up their world title with another run to the grand final when the Rhinos found an unexpected hero at Old Trafford. The, the thing after 2007 was nobody ever backed up at that time, so that was certainly a focus going from the 2007 Grand Final win to the 2008. And I was, I was talking to Kev when we was in the England camps so how good it would be to, to be the first team to, to back up and do it again. Well, the noise inside Old Trafford is absolutely deafening at the moment. It's Burrow. It's a flat pass to Jones Buchanan. It's offload, it's excellent, and Smith is over. Lead strike. Smithy was going to be playing on the wing and um, obviously Webby then, you know, had a back injury, I think, and Smithy had, you know, an outstanding game at full-back. It's a slap on the back for the try-scorer. You know, such a talented player is, is Lee and he had a great game that day and thoroughly deserved the man of the match. It was just one of them games that everything came off for him. You know, his kicking game, he took the game by the scruff of the neck. Smith has done reasonably well. He's done very well in the end, actually. As that ball bounces out of play to the frustration of Francis Melly. You know, kicked to 40 20 as well, I think I recall, and you know, that set the platform for I think one of my tries. Sinfield puts it high. Nelly concentrates, up he goes, can't collect. It'll be another six tackles here. Maguire will not need it. He stops away and scores. Lightning. Ellie Smith was, was fantastic that year for us, and really at the top of his game. He's a first class full back, centre, whatever he wants to play anyway, and, and, and he really came out and showed it. October nights in Manchester were now a regular date for the Rhinos. Old Trafford was quickly becoming a second home. It's a, a historical stadium and, uh, you know, to walk out with all the, the razzmatazz, the party atmosphere, fireworks going off, you know, the shivers go down your spine. Being a Leeds United fan, I, I shouldn't really say this, but it is a great stadium and um, I don't know if it's because we've got rugby league fans in there, but the atmosphere and the intensity and you know, walking down that tunnel, the, the air's on the back of you, you know, they're standing up at the minute speaking about it. We've been there four times and won it four times, you know, it's, it's a place for champions. But to work so hard throughout here and, and know that it culminates at Old Trafford in one special game, to know that all the work you've put in through pre-season, through all the ups and downs you've gone through throughout the year, all the bust-ups in training, throughout the injuries, people being left out. To get through that as a group of blokes is unreal. He's gone for himself, Matt Diskin, and I think he's got it down. Confirmation, surely, yes! Diskin, and Diskin finds Maguire, who's trying to kick in.
I've been practicing with footed kicks and uh, Smithy was saying kick one for me and uh, you know it just happened to happen on the biggest night, the biggest stage. Oh, he might he's offside. I think it's offside. Hang on, they're gonna look at the grounding, are they? They're gonna look at the grounding. This is gonna be given. Whether he was offside or not, you probably have to look in the record books, it says he wasn't, but um, you know, a pretty touch and go and you know if you're a Saints fan you're probably gonna say he's offside, but you know we were we were more than happy to accept uh, the video ref's decision. To do three grand finals on the bounce was a, a great success, it was a great achievement. Doing it once is hard, you know, backing it up year after year is, is very difficult because every team wants to beat you, you know, so it was, a, it was a great achievement. Brian Mack was replaced by Brian Mack in 2010, McDermott succeeding McLennan as head coach at Headingley. Brian's a great leader. He demands and he has uh, expectations of his players like we do of, his, of ourselves and he puts that in place and if you're not pulling your weight, yeah, he'll let you know. I've always loved the environment that Brian McDermott produces. Uh, I know he gets mad when he talks about his military background but um, I love it to bits. Uh, that, that, that sort of real tough move to the next drill environment that he, uh, he produces. But his door's always open, you know, if you want to yarn or, you know, we'll see, uh, just to chat or get things off his chest, you know, he's always there. You know, I've, I've gone on record as, as saying he's the best coach I've ever had. And I know it's been a bit rocky at times, but we've won trophies under him. We've got some strange, strange people in the group. Probably some of the most complex men that's ever walked planet Earth. You know, he understands me as a person. You know, um, I'm, I'm a bit odd, obviously. Carl Ablett. I could spend a whole video, an hour and a half, talking about Carl Ablett. Jamie Peacock is probably the most intelligent yet grumpiest man ever. Danny Mags, I wouldn't play cards with him. Rob, I can never understand what he's saying because he's always gone somewhere else before he, he finishes his sentence. Uh, I could go on, Jamie Jones, Holy Hills. Jamie Jones Buchanan is, uh, he, he changes me. I don't like to speak for too long because I can feel myself changing already. And, and they, they just make the day really interesting to come into work. And uh, it's a full whole day, it's a full week to trying to get it through to them. But that's what makes the job so good. It's, uh, it's such a, they're such an interesting group of people. In 2011, the Rhinos took on their greatest Super League challenge. A march to Old Trafford would have to start from fifth place from where no one had ever claimed the title. We had a bit of a, a decent running towards the back end of what was a really turbulent season. And Ablett has scored the first try for Leeds! So turbulent in inverted commas, I could use another few words about what sort of season that was. Things happened in playoffs for us that we just seemed to be able to nail a performance. I think that if he kicks this, Leeds are going to Old Trafford. The hero of Headingley! That coincided with Brian Mack putting Rob onto the bench, using him as sort of an impact. Burrow's going in for the Rhinos! It's not something I wanted to do, I wanted to start. I felt I, I could have started for Leeds and done as good a job. So it was, it was a big year for me in, in proving to myself and to others that you know I deserve to start. What a night for Brian McDermott and Roy Simmons, the coaches, in their first seasons with their respective clubs. You know, I remember the game being very tight, both teams a bit a bit nervous in the start of that game. And then Rob comes off the bench uh, and scores one of the probably the most individual tries you'll ever see. Oh, he's just under the furrow! And he's outstripped Wellens! It's a brilliant furrow try! A fantastic Rob furrow try! I'm usually not one for knowing what I'm doing at the time. I don't plan things. Uh, a lot of stuff, my body just goes where, where it wants at times. Well, it looked a little bit like Lionel Messi, didn't he, on this famous football ground? He just jigged and stepped and ducked under and then scored under the post. I've watched it back a few times and it's probably the, the biggest moment in my rugby career. Certainly when, when the lads, you know, jumping on you, you know, after, after you've just scored it. Uh, I know I remember Danny being the first one there and there's, there's a clip of him mugging me and it's slow motion and that's something which, will, which I'll, I'll remember for, forever. Unbelievable, Rob. He's just that sort of player. He can turn the, turn the game on its edge just, just in a split second and you know, obviously change the game. The game decider for us was another Rob Burrow moment when he gets out of dummy half, he runs out of dummy half and skirts the line. And Saints are thinking, well, the block can't keep on running, there's no way he can keep on running sideways, yet Rob keeps on running sideways and actually eventually finds a gap and throws one of the most audacious dummies you've ever seen in the grand final. Pretty much 
to attribute that win down to Rob Burrow's influence if he hadn't come off the bench and if he hadn't been, you know, had the uh, the touches that he had, I'm not sure how that game would have panned out. 37 journalists here and 37 journalists voted for that man as the man of the match. It was about proving and, and to myself that year that, you know, I wasn't going backwards as a player, I wanted to keep on the front foot and show that I, I was worthy of being in that, that, that Leeds team starting. And, so it was a big year for me. That one stood out for, for a lot of reasons. And obviously, the Man of the Match uh, awarded that round it off for me. And Leeds are the champions of 2011. A third World Club title was claimed on a memorable night at a packed Headingley. Manly Seagulls beaten in front of a full house. Never got the chance of playing the NRL, so I always wanted to play as well as I possibly could in the World Cup challenges. The Manly game here was great. Yeah, it was quite special because it's at Edenley and you know, I remember the atmosphere there. There was, there was a big crowd, Edenley was packed and uh, just a great atmosphere. Ellen Road's a great stadium, but it's not Edenley. Um, it's not Edenley with 21,000. And... Especially in and Cherry Evans, they go wide, Stewart further wide. We get the Stewart. Oh! Manly were a great team and uh, coming over here and yeah, it was just uh, a great atmosphere, a great game to be involved in. Sinfield, beautiful kick, bouncing everywhere. To go ahead and beat Manly after they beating us before was was a great, great night, a great night, a special night ahead of Kevin Sinfield lifts the trophy and leads our champions of the world. World champions and, once again, Super League champions for a sixth time in 2012 after an extraordinary captain's innings at Old Trafford. I remember going in as, as probably huge underdogs and having smashed in the, in the cup final by Warrington. I think you felt that the game wanted Warrington to win, to go and win the title for the first time. Here comes Sinfield! Sinfield! You know, I remember scoring early. Uh, first grand final try, which was nice. I remember it being real nip and tuck. Oh, that's a, a head flash. I think it was Michael Monaghan, you know, charged late on one of Kevin's kicks, but made contact with it and knocked him out, knocked him out cold. No wonder he's looking concerned. Lose Kev would have been massive. And you straight away as a coach, you think, well, we need to deal with this. Who's going to go away? Who's going to go at six? Who can go on and go play in the centre? And do we need to move a centre onto the wing and somebody at the fullback? And all these things start going through your mind. And I was adamant I weren't coming off. I've been knocked out, you know, I'm just glad those uh, new head rules aren't in. <laughs> I weren't in back then. Miraculously, he carried on and carried on and had a huge influence towards, you know, towards the winning that game. This is massive for Kevin Sinfield and Leeds. 21 from 21, the King of Headingley has done it again. I tell you this now, of all the sportsmen I have ever seen, this guy is the most impressive. Right. They tried to knock you out, they tried to kick you where it hurts, you got up, you kept going, that was immense. Oh, big team effort. Uh, you know, I'd have thought a month ago where we were, we got an absolute talent at Huddersfield. And to pick ourselves up and keep believing, uh, incredible what's happened tonight. She's a big Leeds fan, so, yeah, she was quite emotional and she nearly set me off, actually. She ran off pretty quickly and I certainly remember lifting that trophy. I don't know if that's because I've watched it uh, since, but another special night, you know, to come from fifth again. Having done it in 2011 against a team that beat us in the Challenge Cup final was uh, massive. And people like Rob, Rob Burrow, and, and Danny Mags and Kevin Sinfield have been run at, trampled on, hit, hit late, bashed and bruised and battered. I've said for years, you know, this is one of the toughest groups that's ever played the game. People define tough as many things, and. Uh, you know, walking into pubs with, your, with your, your sleeves rolled up, offering people out is a version of toughness in some people's eyes, not in, not in our eyes. But uh, being able to take some punishment and being able to take some flack and being able to uh, take pressure uh, and not just do that, but then come back and, and reply with some world-class performances and some world-class efforts, that's the true definition of toughness. And if you accept that as a definition of toughness, you've got to, you've got to then accept that this is probably one of the whether it's been the most successful or the most uh, skillful or fastest, it's probably been one of the most toughest Super League squads that's ever played the game. Six grand final wins and three World Club Championships 
had already made it a golden era for this golden group, but there was still one summit that had yet to be reached. You know, there's a lot of emotion, you know, when you go to Wembley and you lose, and, you know, a few of our members have, have done that a few times. To lose five finals and captain aside in five losing finals, it's not a record I'm particularly proud of, and certainly after the 2012 final, I remember saying, saying to myself, oh, this can't happen again, not again. If we'd never won anything again in our lives, you know, you, you couldn't moan, we're, we're, we're over the moon with what we've won, but uh, if you're honest with yourself, there'd have been a, a void there, not having the Challenge Cup. I just got to a point in my career where I was comfortable with the fact that it might not have been my destiny to win a Challenge Cup final. Because at the end of the day, if I had have had a career that looked like a big jigsaw puzzle and there was one piece missing right in the middle, uh, that missing piece would actually be the most interesting thing to talk about. And uh, I was going to make it a positive. And Old Trafford's brilliant. There's about 15 steps, but at Wembley there's about 300. And there's such a mix of fans at Wembley when you're going through all the different clubs and People are really nice, but to walk up as a loser when you just want the ground to swallow you up. And if I'm honest, I just wanted the opportunity to walk up those steps as a winner and, and get the chance to lift that trophy. The 113th Challenge Cup final in 6 tackle. It's a little dialogue. He's only half at a high one up next week. Dawn had to think about this one. And Dawn has missed it. Maguire has picked his pockets in the mini Danny Maguire with a sensational take and a sensational try. Jamie Jones Buchanan Burrow puts it left. Maguire puts it out to Hall. And Hall! Desperately looking for a bit of comfort again. Aiton, across it goes to Ryan Hall. Hall, dragging the fitness with him, over and scores here. Now they can let themselves enjoy this moment, which has been 14 years in the making. We've played in some finals now where they go right to the death. To play in the Challenge Cup final with two or three minutes left after Danny had kicked that top goal. You knew the game along him. Yeah, I think it was just relief at the end of the whistle that, you know, the final whistle that you can you can walk up them stairs, you know, that long flight of stairs, you walk up there and you know and be with each other and, and celebrate that trophy win in uh, you know with all the fans. Certainly what I do three hundred steps to lift that trophy to be about a thousand steps. Really enjoyable moment. Yeah, one I'll never forget. He seemed destined never to stand there and lift that trophy. But this is what the good times look and feel like, Leeds. For this generation of Leeds players, Wembley memories are finally made of this. I tasted success in the Challenge Cup, so I know how good it felt, and I wanted those players I played alongside to feel that as well. We got the win, and it was just a relief that you could really just relax and, and put a big sigh out and, and, and realise that you've you finally got that, that trophy which you know has evaded us for that long. To be able to win there and get the monkey off the back and bring the Challenge Cup home, it were you know, a brilliant, brilliant day. A lot of these boys, like uh, Jamie Jones, Kev, Rob, Mags, you know, they haven't won, so um, it was good to get that win. I was more happy and uh, pleased for them than I was for myself, to be honest. In 20, 30 years' time, we'll still come together you know, the guys that are out there winning that trophy and uh, it'll be like we, we've never been apart. So that's the real you know, prize, if you like, the galvanising experience of, of winning such a prestigious trophy. It's fitting that this group of players and coaches over these, that 10 year period and beyond it uh, should have the accolade of the most successful uh, time in the club's 125 year history. What we've done is set standards, set standards that the next generation of players and coaches and support staff need to not only attain, but surpass. I think everything that we ever do in life gets passed down the ages. Each and every one of us, we're going out there, we play games and you don't know who's watching you, you don't know who's being inspired by you. While I'm here, 
I'm going to do my best to win what I can and, uh, and create that real legacy for, for the next generation. Over the next few years, there's, there's going to be some transition with some senior players dropping out and, and retiring and finishing. But can we pass the baton on to a group of young boys now who, who are, have the same drive and determination and motivation to, to win trophies? Can we pass that on without the weight of huge expectations and, and pressure, but the freedom to go and play, the freedom to play in entertaining rugby, which the club has to do, but with the desire to win trophies. And, and uh, this last 10 years has been great, but it doesn't have to end.